In this video, I'm going to be going through a simple example problem to show you the different methods that you might use to mesh a cylindrical pipe with a 90 degree bend. This is going to be a different style of video to my usual lecture type videos, where I'm actually going to be going through and showing you applications of theory and actually show you the different types of approaches that you could use to address the same problem. This video is going to be really good for you if you're a beginner or you're fairly new to CFD because I'm going to be going through from first principles different types of meshes that you could use to apply to the same application. We're going to be going from tetrahedral meshes all the way through to block structured and O-grid meshes and you're going to understand the decision making process along the way for why we might want to use different types of meshes. If you're more of an advanced CFD user, then it's definitely worth sticking around until the end because actually some of the applications of O-grids and mapped meshes might be slightly different to those which you've seen before in the past and might help you to improve your future meshes. Now, the software I'm going to be using to go through these examples is meshing software called ANSWER from Beta CAE Systems. This video isn't sponsored by Beta CAE Systems, but I wanted to thank them for providing me with a license to do this video and to actually show you meshing processes and procedures using their software. This video is really all thanks to them, and I'd like to extend my thanks to them for providing we, me with a license to use this video. The video isn't sponsored. The reason I chose to use Beta CAE Systems answer is because that's actually the meshing software that I use on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's a really powerful piece of meshing software that gives you the choice of different types of meshing approaches. And you can really use all of them within the same piece of software. You're not really limited by the capabilities of the software. This is going to be fantastic for the examples that I show you today because I'm going to be able to go through all the different types of approaches that you could use to approach this example problem. And then you can take that understanding and take it away with you and apply it to your own meshes so that you can really think about the type of meshing approach that you're using for more complex applications. Right, that wraps up the intro. Let's jump in and have a look at the example problem and start with a very basic meshing approach. The first and most obvious approach that you might use if you're choosing to mesh a pipe or any other CFD geometry is to use a triangular surface mesh over all of the surfaces of the pipe and then to fill the volume of the pipe with tetrahedral cells. This is perhaps the most obvious approach and is the approach that you might be likely to choose if you're a beginner at meshing and CFD. Now let's turn on a quick cut plane so we can see those tetrahedral cells that are currently filling the volume of the pipe mesh. Now what's often not discussed are the three main reasons why this triangular surface mesh and tetrahedral fill is not the best approach that we would use to mesh the pipe or another similar type of CFD geometry. Simply, those three different problems with this approach are one, the resolution at the wall. Secondly, the volume fill or the number of cells that we need to fill the entire volume. And the third problem is numerical diffusion. And what I'm going to be going through in this talk is going through each of these problems in a bit more detail and showing you how we can address them and slowly improve the quality of the mesh that we use for our pipe geometry here. And these same principles can also be applied to other more detailed CFD geometry. So the first thing we're going to look at is the resolution at the wall. And the important thing to remember here is the type of flow that we're trying to simulate. And with this geometry, we're trying to simulate flow in a circular pipe that goes around a bend. And this is an internal flow. And we know that for internal flows, we're going to have uh, a boundary layer that develops along the walls of the pipe. All of the walls of the pipe is going to have that boundary layer that develops from the inlet and then grows until the flow is fully developed. And it also means that the fully developed flow profile that we want to resolve with our solution is going to have much higher gradients towards the wall of the pipe. So the gradients of the flow are going to be much 
steeper towards the wall than they are in the core of the pipe. And you'll remember from basic CFD that the CFD solver is going to calculate the velocity, pressure, temperature, all of the flow variables at the centroids of each of the cells in the mesh. And what that means is that because the code is only calculating the solution at the centroids of each of the cells and the variation of the flow variables between centroids is linear at best, it means with the tetrahedral fill, we can only get a piecewise linear representation across the pipe of the flow profiles. But of course, we know from the physical solution that the gradients are going to be much steeper at the wall. And actually, in order to resolve this profile correctly, and therefore calculate the wall shear stress and the other quantities that we want to calculate from our solution and the pressure drop overall, we need to increase the resolution at the wall. And what you can clearly see here with the tetrahedral cells is there's not, not any increased resolution at the wall. And ultimately, this means if we don't do something here, we're going to calculate the gradients in those wall adjacent cells are going to be incorrect. And the gradient multiplied by the dynamic viscosity in this case will give us the wall shear stress, which will then be incorrect. And integrating the wall shear stress over the entire pipe will allow us to calculate the pressure drop, which will also be wrong. So we need some method of increasing the resolution close to the wall here. And the way we can do that, if we've chosen to do a tetrahedral fill, is to add inflation layers or prismatic layers right at the edge of the flow. And what I'm going to do now is jump into the next mesh to show you what happens when we add those inflation layers close to the wall. So here is our mesh with added layers on the wall surfaces of the pipe. And we can just see from this cross section through the mesh that because the solution is going to be calculated at the centroid of these cells and the layers start very thin on the wall, then as we move away from the wall into the core of the flow, that piecewise linear variation between the centroids of the cells will allow us to get a better resolution of the velocity profile and the other flow, fr flow profiles across uh, the diameter of the pipe. And ultimately, this will improve the accuracy of our wall shear stress calculation and the overall pressure drop for the pipe. And you can see here that the layers grow in thickness as they go away from the wall, both because the, uh, the gradient of the final profile gets less steep as we go towards the core of the flow, but also we want a reasonable transition in volume between that final layer and the tetrahedral fill, which you can see there. And if you're interested in how you calculate the size of the first cell uh, in your layers, the number of layers and the growth ratio, I've covered this in other videos and it involves a calculation of Y plus. So that's an easy way that we can address the first limitation of tetrahedral meshes for pipe flows. We can add layers and that's going to allow us to increase the resolution of our flow uh, away from the wall. But remember that there are still two other main limitations of this meshing approach, using a tetrahedral fill with layers away from the wall. And those limitations are the total number of cells in the mesh or the, the space filling, you can think of it that way. And then the third one is numerical diffusion. And in the next section of this video, I'm now going to go in and look at the limitations on the number of cells and space filling. Now, you may have noticed the second limitation of tetrahedral meshes. If you've ever compared a tetrahedral mesh with a similar mesh, which you may have generated with polyhedral cells or a hex core approach, what you may have noticed is that actually this approach with a tetrahedral volume fill and layers often results in a large number of cells in your mesh. Your cell count often ends up being very high. And what this means for us as CFD users is when we bring the mesh into our CFD solution software, the solution often takes a lot longer to solve. And the reason for that is that the number of cells in our mesh dictates the dimensions of our matrices that, we're, that the CFD solver is going to be solving. And so when we have a larger mesh, more cells in the mesh, then we have larger matrices. 
Each of those matrices takes longer to solve and often the memory requirements are also increased because the number of uh, values that need to be held in memory at a given time are increased. So these meshes have a large number of cells and you may think that actually that's a good thing because more cells might give you greater spatial resolution and so you might think that actually you're getting a more accurate solution because you have more cells. And when it comes to tetrahedral cells, this is not actually the case. And you actually need to think quite carefully about space filling if you want to understand why tetrahedral meshes are actually adding a lot of extra cells, but actually aren't providing you increased levels of resolution that you might expect. And I've created a basic little graphic to help you understand this in 2D, just comparing triangles and squares for filling the volume of a volume uh, mesh of a CFD mesh and what you want to think about is if you were to stack triangles or tetrahedral cells on top of each other to fill a volume and then if you plot along a line through the thickness of that volume of course what you'll find is that the CFD uh, mesh the CFD solution will be picking up the solution at the centroids as you go through those uh, cells and actually what you find is because the tetrahedral cells are arranged fairly randomly you get a fairly uneven spacing of centroids along a particular line through the volume. And by comparing that just with uniform squares, you can see that actually for the same number of cells, in this case I've used eight squares and eight triangles, you can see that the squares fill a much larger volume that you're considering for your CFD domain and actually provide the same or similar levels of resolution to those tetrahedral or triangles, triangular cells. So as you plot along a line through a hexahedral or a polyhedral volume core, you'd actually be getting a similar level of resolution to what you would have with the same size of tetrahedral cells, of course with a different distribution of cells along that line. But the tetrahedral cells or the triangles don't fill as much space. So ultimately you need more of them to fill your entire volume. And this means when you extrapolate this out to the full size of your mesh, that filling the volume or the core of your mesh with a polyhedral or a hexahedral fill ends up resulting in a smaller cell count for the same level of resolution in your solution. So really that's the, that's the second limitation of these tetrahedral meshes is that actually they're not a very efficient way of filling a core of a CFD domain. That doesn't mean that tetrahedral cells or triangular cells aren't useful. They have many other uses in small, complicated regions, and I may show them in future videos. But generally, for filling large volumes of space, tetrahedral cells aren't a very good way of doing that. And that same principle applies here to our pipe mesh. We'd actually like, we'd actually prefer to fill the volume or the core of this mesh with a different type of cell. And that will bring our total cell count down reduce the size of our matrices and give us a faster solution that requires less memory. Now, if you are limited to a tetrahedral uh, core and you don't have the capability for polyhedral or hexahedral cells for some reason, there is another way that you can reduce the total cell count with this mesh. And that may not be obvious at first glance, but actually when you think about it, we've generated this this mesh starting with a triangular surface mesh. And you can see that each of those triangular cells is projected out from the surface to create prism layers. And then we grow tetrahedral cells off the end of those prism layers to fill the core. Now, an easy way we can reduce the total number of cells in the mesh is to use a quadrilateral surface mesh rather than a triangular surface mesh. So then when each of those quadrilaterals is projected off the surface to form the layers, actually the total number of layers or the cells that we've used in the layers will be reduced. And of course, at the top of the layers, we'll have to grow a pyramid off the top of that rather than a tetrahedral cell directly. So that is another method that you can use to reduce the total cell count, but you still have this volume fill of tetrahedral cells. And what I'm going to show you now is just a quick comparison of this exact same mesh, but rather than using a tetrahedral uh, fill, we're just going to quickly look at a polyhedral fill 
and a hexahedral fill and look at the total number of cells and see how it rapidly goes down when we change the core fill. Currently we have about 290,000 cells in the mesh, so roughly uh, just over a quarter of a million. Let's see what happens when we switch to a hexahedral fill or a polyhedral fill. So here's the first example where we've used a hex core approach rather than a tetrahedral fill to fill the volume. And you can see just looking at this mesh, we've still got the same layers that we had from before. And then at the top of the layers, we transition first using pyramids and then a combination of pyramids, uh, prisms and tetrahedral cells to get into the hex core fill in the middle. And the most important thing we see is that the total number of cells has dropped from 290,000 down to 170,000. So we're almost, we've almost dropped the total number of cells by 50% just by changing the volume fill. And the other thing that I've done here as well, which some of you may have noticed, is I've used a surface mesh that's mostly squares and quadrilateral cells with a few triangles. So that has the other effect of reducing the number of cells in the layers as well. But what happens if we go a stage further and use a polyhedral fill rather than a hexahedral fill? Now, finally, let's look at the polyhedral fill. And you can see quite clearly from the polyhedral fill that even though the level of resolution might actually look similar to the tetrahedral fill, if we check the number of cells, the number of cells has gone down to less than 100,000. So for this particular application, using the polyhedral volume fill has cut the number of cells in the mesh down from around 300,000 down to around 100,000. So it's only around a third. And this is going to give a much more rapid solution when we pass this mesh over to the CFD code. So that finishes off the second limitation of the tetrahedral fill, which is the most basic way of uh, looking at meshing a pipe flow. I'm now going to look at the third limitation, which is often not very well understood, and that is numerical diffusion. And in order to look at this, I'm going to flick over to some lecture slides so that I can go through numerical diffusion in a bit more detail. Then once we've done that, I'm going to come back and show you some better ways which you can mesh uh, your pipe flow, which will actually lead to far greater results. The best way to understand numerical diffusion is with a simple example problem. The example problem I want you to consider is flow through a 2D square domain or flow through a 2D box shaped domain like you can see on the slide here. We've got flow coming through the left boundary of the box and flow going out of the right boundary of the box and I haven't got any flow going through the top or bottom walls. And what I want you to think about specifically for this example problem is imagine the case where we know the velocity field everywhere inside the box. And you could imagine this being the scenario where we have a free slip wall or a zero gradient wall at the top and bottom of our domain. And we've got a velocity of two meters per second going from left to right, coming in the left end of the domain and out the right end of the domain. And with this box, we don't have any obstacles inside the box. And so the flow profile is just going to be the same everywhere. We know the velocity field. It's going two meters per second from left to right in all of the cells inside the domain. So a very specific example problem where we know what the flow velocity is. Now the difference is while we know the flow velocity, we're actually wanting to calculate the temperature field or uh, another scalar variable inside the box that's being transported by the velocity field. And the specific example I want you to think about is where the inlet flow is hot at the top and cold at the bottom. So the temperature profile is say 100 degrees at the top and zero degrees at the bottom. A way you could think about this is two parallel flow streams coming into the box at the same speed, but the top flow stream is hot and the bottom flow stream is cold. 
And the reason we would want to solve this example problem is because of course those flow streams are going to mix with each other and we want to work out what the temperature field is going to be in the box and what the temperature profile is going to be coming out of the box. But in this case, we know the velocity field itself, the flow streams are going at two meters per second, so we know the velocity everywhere in the box. We just want to know what's the temperature field and how is that temperature profile going to mix within the box. And in order to solve this problem, we already know the velocity field, so we don't need to solve the continuity and Navier-Stokes equations. All we need to do is solve a transport equation for temperature or enthalpy or total energy, some kind of energy transport equation. And the transport equation I've chosen to use is the one here on the slide. There's no unsteady term, there are no source terms. We only have a balance between advection of temperature by the velocity field and diffusion of the temperature due to its gradients. And in this equation, fairly standard form, we've got K is the thermal conductivity, rho is the density of the fluid, and Cp is the specific heat capacity of the fluid. And as normal, the term on the left-hand side is the advection term, and the term on the right-hand side is the diffusion term. So this is the equation we're going to solve and use it to calculate the temperature field everywhere inside the box, and that's going to show us how the temperature of those flow streams mixes together. And you might already suspect just by looking at this equation that the uh, mixing of those flow streams is going to depend on the properties. So the thermal conductivity, the density, and the specific heat capacity. Now, how is the solution going to look? So assuming we have a CFD code or some kind of finite volume or finite difference code to solve that transport equation, how is the solution going to look? Well, we have the hot flow at the top and we have the cold flow at the bottom. And those two terms that we have in the transport equation, we have an advection term and we have a diffusion term. And physically, what do they mean? Well, advection is transport of the energy or the temperature in the direction of the flow. So the flow is going to be carrying that energy from the left boundary to the right boundary in the direction of the flow. Now, diffusion is different. Diffusion occurs in the direction of the temperature gradient. So you can think of this like two vectors for the, the heat flow. One vector is pointing in the direction of the fluid flow, that's left to right, and diffusion is a vector which is pointing in the vertical direction, in the direction of the temperature gradient from hot to cold. And so how the solution is going to look is depending on the magnitude of the diffusion relative to the advection, we're going to get a smearing of the profiles as thermal energy is transported from the top to the bottom in the direction of diffusion. And that thermal conductivity, K, is going to tell us the degree of diffusion or the degree of mixing. And if we have a small conductivity, then we might get a small amount of mixing. But if we have a large conductivity, those flow streams are going to mix together really effectively. So this is what the solution of our problem is going to look like, and we're going to use it to understand the process of numerical diffusion rather than physical diffusion. And if we go back to that transport equation, of course the term on the right-hand side describes molecular or physical diffusion that we would have in the fluid as the atoms and molecules bounce around and exchange thermal energy with each other. That term represents a physical process, physical diffusion. But we want to only look at numerical or artificial diffusion that arises from the discretization of the transport equation that we're solving. So in order to isolate that effect and not confuse it with the molecular diffusion, we're going to set the thermal conductivity to zero. So we've got no molecular diffusion anymore, and we've only got the advection term. And this key piece of understanding allows us to highlight the numerical or artificial diffusion that we're looking at here arises from the numerical discretization of the advection term only. And this numerical or artificial diffusion will occur in all of the transport equations that we're solving. So it would occur in the momentum equation and in the turbulent scalar equations, for example. But of course, for this example, I'm only looking at the energy equation. We want to know the numerical diffusion that's arising from this uh, advection term. 
And ultimately, this is going to affect how we mesh our geometry. So what happens? Well, the theoretical solution, if we solve that equation uh, analytically by hand, and we don't apply any numerical discretization, the theoretical solution, because we only have advection, we've got no diffusion, then the thermal energy is just transported in the direction of the flow from left to right, and that step profile in the temperature, which we apply at the inlet, is also passed out of the outlet, and the gradient there is completely preserved. We've got no conductivity and no uh, diffusion in the direction of the temperature gradient. So this is the theoretical solution. But what happens if we discretize that advection equation and solve it numerically? What happens? You can probably guess what's going to happen. But actually, the surprising result here is that if we discretize this equation numerically using square cells, so perfect cells for CFD, square cells only, and we use upwind interpolation for that advection term, what we find is that actually the theoretical solution is produced exactly. There's no numerical diffusion. And if you want details of how you would actually solve and prove this result, you can find it in the famous textbook by Patanka on page 106. But yes, if we use square cells and upwind interpolation, we produce the theoretical solution. There's no numerical diffusion and the step profile in temperature that's applied at the left end of the domain is advected perfectly out of the right hand side of the domain. But the key point to note from this talk and about numerical and artificial diffusion is what happens if we change the flow direction. So rather than having the flow coming in from the left end of the domain and then coming out of the right end of the domain, if we solve the same problem, but have the flow coming in at 45 degrees, so we've now got one of the boundaries, say the bottom boundary at 100 degrees and then the side boundary at zero degrees, the theoretical solution, again, would be to preserve those profiles, preserve it as it's advected through the domain, hot on the bottom, cold on the top. But actually, if we solve that same problem that we did on the previous slide using square cells, upwind interpolation, we find that we get diffusion of the profile. The gradient is smeared out and we're getting this effect of diffusion even though the conductivity is set to zero. We don't have any physical conductivity here, but we're getting a diffusion effect anyway. And this numerical diffusion would also be present in our CFD simulations of larger cases and would pollute the solution and reduce its accuracy. So we don't want this numerical diffusion. But for some reason, it seems to arise when we change the flow direction. And if you want to look into that in more detail, again, if you go to that textbook by Patanka, and there are other sources as well, you can find this discussed in more detail. So clearly, we don't want the numerical diffusion. What are the takeaways from this? How can we reduce it? It's going to pollute our CFD solution uh, when we we actually only want to apply the correct amount of diffusion, which is captured by our thermal conductivity. If we have too much, our solution is not going to be correct. And we can reduce it by refining the mesh, as you might have, might have guessed, if we go from those larger square cells down to smaller square cells, the degree of numerical diffusion reduces. And we can also reduce it by using higher order discretization schemes. So rather than using that upwind interpolation, we could use a second order upwind scheme or something else, and that would also reduce the degree of numerical diffusion. So that's how we could reduce it. But why am I telling you this? What's the key takeaway for mesh construction? That's really the idea of this whole talk and this whole video. This consideration of numerical diffusion, how does it affect the way that we want to construct our mesh in the first place? And you may have noticed that it's something to do with the flow direction and the cells that we're using. Now, if we go back to that first example where we have flow coming in from the left and out from the right, we saw from the first example that if we use perfectly square cells that are aligned with the flow direction, then the gradient, that step profile is preserved and we don't have any numerical diffusion. And this is telling us that physically, for the same level of mesh resolution and the same discretization schemes, we want to try and align our cells with the flow in order to reduce the effect of numerical diffusion. And of course, as mesh constructors, that 
means we have to think a bit about our solution when we're actually building the mesh. Where is the flow going and can we align ourselves with the flow direction? So if rather than taking this approach for meshing, if we still use those square cells, but we rotated them slightly, if the cells weren't aligned with the flow direction, you can see we're getting towards that scenario we considered in number two, where the flow wasn't aligned with the square cells and we expect to get some numerical diffusion. So we want to try and align ourselves with the flow direction. And for constructing meshes, this tells us that if we're using hexahedral cells or square cells, we can align them with the flow direction or very close to the flow direction if we design our mesh carefully. And that's what I'm gonna look at when we jump back to look at the meshes. But the other important observation is that if we use a stack of triangular tetrahedral cells and pyramids, we're never going to be able to align all of the cells with the flow direction because the orientation of those triangles and those pyramids changes as we go across the mesh. And you can really see that when you look at the mesh and you're gonna see that a bit more when we jump back to look at the images. We're never going to be able to align ourselves with the flow direction. And this is why people often state and often quote that tetrahedral cells are more diffusive that's what they mean typically. It's that for a given flow profile, the tetrahedral cells can't be aligned with the entire flow profile. And so there's going to be more numerical diffusion than an equivalent mesh that used hexahedral cells that were aligned with the flow direction. So this is the key third limitation of filling our volume with tetrahedral cells. We actually want to move more towards a situation like this. And now if we go back to meshing into the meshing software, we can start to look at some better approaches for filling our volume with cells. So let's jump back in and look at our tetrahedral mesh again. I want you to imagine flow approaching the pipe from the left end and passing along through the thickness of the volume. Using that understanding of numerical diffusion that we've just developed, you can see that the layers are actually fairly well aligned with the flow direction. And these are expected to give quite good results with minimal numerical diffusion. But if we now look at the core, as the flow passes through those layers of tetrahedral cells and triangular cells, they're never going to be aligned with the flow direction. And so we're going to get uh, additional numerical diffusion from our choice of cells in the core. And hopefully now this is really starting to build up a picture for you about my, why we might want to move away from a tetrahedral fill. So what happens if we go to a hex core approach? Let's go back and look at our hex core approach again. If we go back to our hex core approach and again take a slice through the volume to look at the volume fill, Again, we can see that the layers are going to be nicely aligned with the flow direction and the core of the mesh as well, because we're using uniform cubes, those cubes are also going to be nicely aligned with the flow direction. But of course, the hex core approach isn't perfect either, because you can see that we have to use layers of pyramids and tetrahedral cells to transition from the layers into the hex core fill in the middle. So we haven't completely gotten rid of numerical diffusion. We've definitely gotten a lot better through our choice of core, but we can probably do even better. And in order to do that, we're going to have to move over to some more structured approaches. And for those of you who've done a lot of CFD meshing and are experienced, you're going to be more used to these structured approaches. But hopefully now you can start to build up and see the reason why we want to first move away from the tetrahedral fill and then actually also we want to move away from the hex core fill as well. The hex core fill still has its uses though, because this geometry may be uh, attached to a much larger geometry where we can't use a structured approach throughout the entire domain. And actually this is probably the best we could use for a more complex geometry. But what if we are just solving a pipe flow or a simple geometry? Can we do even better and get rid of these pyramids and these tetrahedral cells? So let's take that idea of aligning ourselves with the flow direction and see if we can improve our mesh. Now the approach I'm gonna show you next is a simple block structured approach with a single block. And the way this approach works 
is we have a single cuboid shaped block which is associated with the walls of the pipe and it's associated all the way through the geometry so we have hexahedral cells all the way along the pipe and we saw in that previous discussion of numerical diffusion that those hexahedral cells are a great way to fill the volume and also a good way to minimize numerical diffusion when they're aligned with the flow. And we can see just by looking through a cross section of the mesh that we have hexahedral cells all the way through the mesh so we don't have any transition through pyramids or tetrahedra. They're aligned with the flow direction and they're very efficient at filling space. Now, there are still two problems with this single block structured approach, which we're going to need to address. And the first problem you can clearly see from the cross section of the mesh is the resolution close to the wall. So even though we've adopted hexahedral cells throughout the mesh, we still need to increase that resolution normal to the wall so that we can resolve the flow profile. And the second limitation that we have to overcome, we can see if we look at the end of the mesh. And if I turn off the cut plane and look at the end of the mesh, we can see that the second problem with a basic block structure approach is cell quality. And you can see from the end of the mesh that we have a cuboid shaped structure which is associated to the cylindrical wall of the pipe. But the problem is these cells in the corner, so the corners of that cuboid shaped block, where the way they're associated to the surfaces of the walls of the pipe ends up with highly skewed cells in the corner of the block. And of course, these highly skewed cells will continue all the way along the length of the pipe and will be difficult for the CFD solver to converge. So this single block structured approach has many of the good foundations that we want. We've got all hexahedral cells which are going to minimize numerical diffusion and are very efficient at filling the volume, but we need to do something to improve the skewness or the cell quality of these cells and also improve the resolution of the cells normal to the wall. And there are actually two different methods which we can use to do this. We can either use a mapped approach where we uh, construct a surface mesh on the end of the of the end of this pipe and then sweep it through the domain, or we use something which is called an O-grid, which is a type of block structuring. And that's what I'm going to go through in the next section. What you can see on screen is often referred to as a standard O-grid. And you can see that what's happened is that cuboid shaped block that was originally associated directly to the corners of the pipe has now been offset into the core of the pipe itself. And that's allowed us to do two things. Firstly, it's allowed us to add some resolution normal to the wall. So we're going to be capturing the high gradients of the flow profiles normal to the wall. And the other thing it's done is it's removed those high skewness cells from the corners of the block that we had before. The O-grid approach is very popular and has been around for many years and you can see why. It addresses many of those problems that the single block approach provides. And of course, looking through the cross section of the mesh, we find that all of the cells are going to be hexahedral once again, so they're very effective at space filling and minimizing numerical diffusion. But the standard O-grid, which you can see here, is not perfect. There are a few problems which you can start to see if you look closely at the core of the O-grid. And really the problems come in around the corner of this central block that we've offset from the edges. And you can see that the cells that are around the corner are skewed by the presence of that 90 degree corner. These cells are skewed and there's also quite a sharp transition in volume between these outer cells and the inner cells. And of course, the O-grid is projected all the way through the length of the pipe. So these cells are going to have poor quality all the way along the pipe. And the other problem which we see with this is that this edge here expands as it goes towards the center of this central square block. And if we were to use a larger central square block or a smaller one, this transition at the middle of the block could end up being quite large as well. So really, we still have a few problems. The standard O-grid is good, but it's not perfect. We don't quite have 
uh, high quality cells at the corners there. We'd really like to do something there. And you can just see by looking at it that the way we probably want to do that is by increasing this angle here that we have at the corner to try and reduce the skewness in those two cells. And uh, ANSWER in particular has two very useful uh, methods of addressing this problem with the standard O-grid and I'm going to start by showing you them in the next section of the video. The first method that ANSWER provides for dealing with some of those problems of the standard O-grid you can see on the screen here and I've turned on the edges of the blocks so that you can really see what ANSWER is doing. Now the method that ANSWER provides for dealing with pipe flows and O-grids is by curving the edges of the central block. And this approach is done as standard. You don't have to manually click and drag the edges of this central block, which can be really useful to you, particularly if you have a long pipe with lots of bends and lots of different sections. You don't want to have to move along the pipe and click and drag all these edges manually. ANSWER has a really good way of controlling this, which is one of the reasons why I particularly like it. But what effect does having this curved central block have for our O-grids? Well, the key is to once again focus on the corners of that central block. And you can see that what the curve does is it opens up that corner angle. So these two cells which are sitting on the corner and of course are projected all the way along the pipe, their angle has been reduced. So their cell, these cells are going to be much less skewed. They're going to have better quality. And the way that the curved O-grid block does this is by skewing this cell which sits on the inside of the central block. And overall there's a balance here where we have now all three cells have not perfect skewness but a lot better. Of course the central block would have an ideal uh, cell shape if it, was at, if it was at 90 degrees. But this, this curved method does do a really good compromise and brings all three of those cells in the corner to a similar level of skewness and quality. And this approach for uh, meshing the pipe will run really well in the CFD software. So this is a fantastic approach that ANSWER has. And actually, this is still not a perfect approach. We can see that we've got a better transition here in the middle uh, between the, this outer block and this central block because we've bought the edge out so there's a better transition. But could we do something even better? Actually, ANSWER provides one further approach for automatic block shaping for pipes, and that is to use a bell-shaped O-grid, and I'm really excited to show you that in the next section of this video. Now, you may not have come across a bell-shaped O-grid before, so I'm just going to take a minute or two to explain to you the features in detail so that you can start to understand it. What you can see straight away is that the bell shape is trying to address those limitations that we had when our core block was a square shape. We've brought the central edges out from the perfect square that we had in the middle so that we're going to have a better transition between these outer blocks and the central blocks. We've brought that central block out, but then rather than using uh, a curve, we've now used a bell shape. So when we focus on those cells in the corner, you can see that we have almost like an intermediate case between using a 90 degree square in the corner and that more open square that we had on the curved shape block before. And as a result, the skewness of these two outer cells is improved slightly. It's not as bad as it was when we had a 90 degree corner, but then the skewness is uh, still a little bit worse than if we had uh, that concave shape for the curved block as well. So the bell-shaped O-grid is another option that you can have in ANSWER by default. It's really easy to, to turn on and you can control the curvature of this uh, bell with a parameter. You don't have to click and drag the edges manually. So this is a another fantastic feature that ANSWER has for creating uh, O-grids for pipe meshes. And before I move on, I don't want us to lose track of the fact of what we've actually done here. Remember that when we're using the O-grid, we're going to be getting hexahedral cells along the entire length of the pipe which is great for space filling and reducing numerical diffusion and it's always worth checking this visually just by turning on a cut plane and having a look uh, along the length of the pipe and once again you can see that we've got that increased resolution normal to the wall which is exactly what we want 
and the transition there which doesn't use any pyramids or tetrahedral cells and then fully hex fill as well. So the O-grid blocks, regardless of whether we choose to use uh, a bell-shaped O-grid or a curved O-grid, all of these approaches do a fantastic job of creating that nice structured mesh all the way through our pipe. But we aren't quite there yet. There's one final approach that I want to talk to you about which has some further advantages over the O-grids that I've shown you here. And the primary thing that I want you to think about is the number of cells that we're using. And remember back from our, uh, our theoretical solution for the uh, velocity profile in the pipe, we know that we have higher gradients near the wall and actually towards the center of the pipe, the velocity profile, particularly if we have a turbulent flow, is going to be more flat and the gradients in that region of the pipe are going to be a lot lower. And you can see, even just from looking at our mesh, that we still have quite a lot of cells in the middle of the pipe. And this is fine, we're going to get a nice accurate answer, but in terms of efficiency, we might actually have a few too many cells in the center of the pipe. And there's one final approach which we can use for creating a nice structured pipe mesh, and that's using a mapping approach. And the advantage of using a mapping approach is that actually we can reduce the number of cells in the core a little bit so that we have an even more efficient mesh while still retaining the accuracy. And that's what I'm going to show you in the next section. Now, a mapped approach might be something that you haven't come across before, but it's an alternative method of meshing pipes and other geometries. And it's really straightforward to carry out in answer. Now, the way that we carry out a mapped approach is rather than creating a series of hexahedral blocks and associating them with the geometry, what we do with a mapped approach is we generate a surface mesh on the end of the pipe, surface meshes on the sides of the pipe, and then sweep that map that surface on the end of the pipe all the way through the mesh, and that allows us to create uh, hexahedral cells as we sweep them along the pipe one cell at a time. Now the mapped approach gives us flexibility because we can construct the surface mesh for the end of the pipe however we want, and it's this flexibility that allows us to improve our mesh even further. And just by looking at the mapped approach, you can see that actually the layout of the cells on the end of the mesh is actually very similar to the O-grid, and we're going to get a very similar outcome. We have our thin cells uh, close to the wall, which we grow away from the surface, so we're going to be able to capture those uh, high gradients that occur no normal to the wall of the pipe. So we have that feature of the mesh, which is what we want. And then as we come towards the center of the pipe, one thing you may notice is that we've introduced some triangles. And this is where the real difference comes in between the mapped approach and the O-grid approach. In the mapped approach, we can introduce triangles. And you may think, surely the entire intention of us trying to use O-grid approaches and mapped approaches is that we wanted to move away from triangles. We didn't want to have tetrahedral cells and pyramid cells in our mesh because those types of cells increase numerical diffusion and aren't very efficient at filling space. But the key thing to notice here is that these triangles are going to be mapped along the length of the pipe. They're gonna be projected one cell at a time along the length of the pipe. And when the triangle is mapped, that's going to create a triangular prism or a, penta, a pentacell, as it's often called, a pentahedra, rather than a tetrahedra or a pyramid. So this is a triangular prism. And the important thing is, is that actually the flow will be normal to those triangular faces of the prism. And so the triangular prism is still going to be effective at reducing numerical diffusion. And actually, if we put on a cut plane through the mesh, you can see this in even more detail. What you can see looking through the cut plane is that with this approach, even though we've introduced triangles, we still have that resolution normal to the wall and we have a nice transition towards the hexahedral fill here with our mesh. So we have the similar internal structure to what we had for our purely hexahedral or O-grid approaches. This is exactly the type of mesh that we want. We don't have tetrahedral or pyramids. Actually, some of these cells are the sides of 
the triangular prisms that are being projected along the length of the flow. So this, even though we would rather not have the triangular prisms, it's still really useful to introduce them here with the mapped approach. And I'm gonna show you why in a bit more detail now. If we go back and look at the end of the mesh that we've just created with our mapped approach, what I want you to think about is firstly, if we look at the corners of that central block, once again, we've opened up the angle by using a curved approach, which is similar to the curved O-grid approach. So the skewness of these two cells along the outside of the central block are much improved. And we've done that at the expense of slightly skewing that central square. But the key reason for introducing triangles here is actually due to the number of cells and the size transition. And what I want you to think about is the number of cells that we put along the circumference of our pipe that we haven't really talked about before, every single one of these lines in a standard O-grid approach would have to travel all the way through along the center of the O-grid through the core region and out the other side. So if we increase the resolution around the circumference, we'd also be increasing the resolution in the center of the pipe. We'd be adding more cells to the center. And what that does, of course, is that increasing the circumferential resolution adds more cells to the center of the pipe, which we don't actually need there because we know that our pipe profile, the fully developed velocity profile, is more broad at the center. The velocity gradients are much lower. And so actually we don't need additional resolution near the center of the pipe. But what we've done here, which is really clever, is by introducing some triangles, we've managed to get rid of some of these grid lines and reduce the number of cells that we have in the middle of the pipe. So we're filling the space at the center of the pipe more efficiently while still allowing us to keep the high level of resolution that we want close to the walls, both normal to the wall and in the circumferential direction. We could add more cells across the circumference and then add a few more triangles and still not increase the resolution at the core unnecessarily. So this is a mapped approach. This is another alternative method that you could use to mesh uh, a pipe to have the highest level of accuracy and to be really efficient. But ultimately, the important takeaway from the methods that I've presented to you here today is that there are many different possible approaches you could use. And most often in CFD, we don't solve a simple pipe in isolation. Often our pipe is connected to a much more complicated geometry and it's the considerations of the rest of the geometry and the rest of the structure of our flow domain that will probably limit us in choosing the method that we want to mesh the pipe and the rest of the domain. And it's those considerations that will allow you to make the choice. And hopefully from watching this video from the start, you'll now be aware of some of the limitations that you introduce depending on the method that you choose to mesh your geometry. So that brings me to the end of the video. I'd once again like to thank Beta CAE Systems for providing me with the license to use ANSWER to show you the meshing tutorials in this video. And I'd also like to ask you as well, did you enjoy the video? Did you find it useful? Would you like to see more videos of this style where I go through meshing and different meshing approaches? Let me know in the comments section and if it's popular enough, I'll see if I can arrange more meshing videos where I can go through more detailed applications for you to get you more comfortable with different meshing approaches and how you can mesh your own geometry. Thank you very much for listening and I'll see you in the next video.